Okay, we are live. Uh, so this is our second contributor of Salvers, first one that we are finally recording. Uh, the first item of the agenda is could Prometheus docs improvements? And there's a linked issue uh, in the document. So I know we have already started. Uh, there we have what PRs merged already. Uh, anything else that we would like to discuss? Um, right now, I think merging both PRs is the first the first step uh, to what we need to do. And then later, I think we should start um, looking at expanding the documentation because we have quite a lot of issues that are um, frequently mentioned and doing just a bit of documentation on those could help new users. And however, for finding those, we would probably need to see through um, issues and discussions. Maybe the discussions would be better at, at that point. What do you think? Okay, uh, let me recap just to make sure I understood. Uh, so you're saying we have a lot of uh, questions on discussions, issues, like asking the same things, but we don't have that on docs. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Or we could just keep that in mind. And if that issues um, recur, just create a documentation um, tag or or something. like Because we already have a label on GitHub that is kind slash documentation. So we could just assign that label to issues that we want to, like to support issues but we would see um, as a good candidate to add documentation on that. Are the questions typically coming in in GitHub issues are kind of over Slack and stuff as well? Uh, they are coming in three forms, basically. So GitHub issues, uh, GitHub discussions, mm -hmm. and Slack. And for, for GitHub issues, we can easily label that. For GitHub discussions, that's not so easy, um, but we can still look at that at some like at some point or uh, create issues from that. And as for Slack, um, we could either point people to create an issue that the documentation is lacking, so we have um, something to work off, or we can create those ourselves. Uh... I am not entirely sure because I don't keep up uh, as much as you do with, with support. But I feel like almost all the support is whether asking for, like, they don't know how Prometheus work or how Alert Manager, or they assume that we maintain the Helm stack as well. But are, do we, like, are there really issues about chasing that? Uh, they are not always, but it's hard to actually figure out from, it's frequently hard to figure out figure out uh, whether the issue is about um, the usage of Prometheus or, or Alert Manager, or if, it's a config or if that's a configuration or misconfiguration issue. And we, historically, we took care of both because Cube Prometheus and Prometheus Operator are kind of uh, working together as a project, as projects. Um, which means that if that's the issue with Prometheus operator, but it happens in Cube Prometheus, we are transferring the issue and still answering that in Prometheus operator. We rarely um, point to Prometheus as a source to, to figure out what is the cause. Because you usually that's not actually in Prometheus. I see. Yeah, sounds, sounds good to me, actually. Uh, just trying to organize how we how we triage that. Just uh, just going to like taking one day. Maybe maybe we could uh, use this meeting if we want a day with, that we don't have much agenda. Yeah, that that sounds sounds good.
Hey, while you're typing, I think we can go to the next one. Yes, sorry. So uh, the next topic is, uh, I, I added this, this topic to discuss for to multiple uh, different uh, Kubernetes distributions. So one thing that I have a very hard time maintaining is any issue or pull requests that do changes to anything that is not native Kubernetes or kind, because I, I, I do have, it's easy for me to spin up a kind cluster and GKE, but all the others I don't have access. I have no idea how to, to, to respond to this. Yeah, so um, what we have is the platform setting. I think you are referring to this part. Yeah. Which is um, just kind of broken in current state. So the idea behind that was to, like, the initial idea and the best one that we had right now was to run the generation step, uh, put the manifests, like the manifest directory out of the repository, put it onto some S3 bucket or whatever object storage and pre-generate pre every manifest for every pl platform that we have. This would simplify consumption uh, for users because they would need to just apply manifests and not even use JSON it for, for the most part. But the hard part is uh, how do we actually store that without paying for this because we don't have any funding. So um, that was the initial idea. However, right now it's not really viable, I think. And maybe when Cloudflare finishes very uh, R2, uh, object storage, which is supposed to be free. Um, maybe we can go back to that. But as for the the issue, um, the idea was that the platform setting would be a thin layer on top of what we are providing. Uh, it doesn't work like that right now because it's uh, integrating in a lot of things on a different layer than it should, especially when it comes to, I think, Azure or something like that, because everything else is basically uh, applying the managed cluster uh, add-on and not doing anything more. It's just a matter of reconfiguring Kube proxy, reconfiguring Kube uh, controller manager and API server, I think. And that's, usually, that's actually one of the issues that we are seeing frequently and could be documented a bit more, I think. There is also uh, alerts, right? Like, I think the main difference is is the mixins. Uh, no, the mixins are actually configured fairly good, I think, uh, because what you are saying is the alerts for Kube Controller Manager, Scheduler, and uh, Kube. Yeah, Proxy. yeah, for the API. Yeah, for and, the master uh, components. Yeah, and th those are turned off. Uh, if you don't have, if you have, uh, if you apply managed cluster add-on, because managed cluster add-on disables service monitors for those uh, configurations, and if you don't have a service monitor, those alerts, and I think also those uh, disables those alerts, and they shouldn't fire at that point. Oh really? Yeah, because we did that managed. I need to check that, but. Originally, we did that managed uh, cluster add-on just for this purpose. So the alerts that are related to those components are not actually working. OK. Uh, is that yeah. also That's... this lack of, of someone joining? Yeah, so this is actually changing like the Managed cluster add-on. Hello. Hello, hello. Hey. Yeah, so the managed cluster add-on is actually changing right now Kube controller manager and Kube scheduler. Like it's turning off the service monitors by nullifying them. Mm -hmm. And it's changing a Prometheus rule for a Kubernetes system control manager and system scheduler. And I think we are lacking proxy right now, Kube proxy there, because we added support for that. However, also Kube proxy has a switch in a different place, which we should probably land here too. Okay, I see. 
Uh, all right, so basically what you did, the way you rebuild, you don't actually run Kubernetes on different platforms. You just render and see the what is rendered. Yep. Okay. It's basically documentation. And if, if you need to run it, you can always ask for the community support. Because usually someone that reports the issue, um, they are using that platform. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of working together with, with those people. And documentation. <laughs> we should probably think about like setting up uh, setting up the website correctly because right now it's a bit broken it's in some cases Okay. Uh, the next one is also added by me. Uh, so we just uh, made the Prometheus custom resource uh, to work on agent mode. Uh, I'm just wondering if we need, like, is that something that we want to guarantee? Maybe add tests that in agent mode it does run correctly. Uh, you want to add those where? Uh, Prometheus operator. It's just an end-to-end -end test. Like we we define a custom resource in the running similar to uh, what an agent would, would run and expect that it, it runs and it scrapes and it writes somewhere else. We can add that in two places. We can add that either in Cube Prometheus because it has also access to everything, or we can add that in uh, Prometheus Operator. I'm not sure where would be the better place for that because bear in mind that this test, ah, no, it doesn't need to apply a new CRD. CRD is the same. So I don't, I don't really where the like the like the previous discussion uh two weeks ago i remember that we are not sure if that's something that we really want to support or not like if we commit hey we want to support that but we, we want to we'll need to like maintain and make sure that this always works and if this if we want this to always work we need we need tests yeah i i agree and probably I think we need to have those in both places, in Prometheus Operator and in uh, Cube Prometheus, but for different different parts. Sorry, <laughs> please go ahead. No worries. Because for Cube Prometheus, we need to test if that, like, we'll, there is a PR that adds basically an example for how to run the Prometheus operator with, with all that, um, with the CR and the Prometheus operator, but we would need to add some tests to that. Well, example is also a test, but that's also only for JSON part. And I agree that Prometheus operator tests would be necessary to, to have that. But I think you added some of those uh, in the PR that enables uh, the ability. No, I did to... not. Okay. I, the, what I did was add the support and thinning up tests that started to fail because of the changes, and that's it. It's the idea long term that we're supposed to um, or that we plan to create a standalone custom resource for the agent, right? Yeah. 
So I guess it's still useful to have the skeleton test to, to have that going forward. Yeah, but we probably need some time to actually like test test run that before committing to the CRD first. Philip, it's joining. Yeah, I, I, for the Asian custom resource, we probably want to wait until Asian moves out of data, I guess. Yep, yeah, that would make sense. Hello. Hello, sorry, was clashing with some internal meeting, but uh, yeah, make it, made it short. Uh, so we just finished the last topic, I think. Yeah, we were just discussing the, the tests for Prometheus CR uh, when running the Prometheus agent. But we should probably add some E2D testing in Prometheus operator for that particular feature. And yeah, then that definitely makes sense to me. Like that was something I was uh, planning. But uh, yeah, if anybody has a chance to look at it, then go ahead. Yeah. The the PR I, I raised uh, it didn't close the issue for the agent support. So like I didn't want to say that this is the yeah the support that we want to provide. We want to make it better. Yeah, definitely. Like we said last time, that's a stopgap solution so that at least we know people are not blocked. Like. Okay. Hello. Um, did you see Frederick's comment that this um, the the agency are might be a good introduction or might be a good uh, segue into the scrape CRD because um, we could already add the scrape CRD uh, with the minimum required fields to support the agent, and we could then over time start building it out slowly. I'm not sure if that's a good idea, bad idea. It, to me, it sounded like something that uh, is worth trying. I'm not really familiar with, with this uh, idea. What is those uh, additional scripts? Yeah, so the idea is that uh, for right now, we are Prometheus operator is supporting only Kubernetes uh, as the uh, Kubernetes as the config as the scrape configuration for for Prometheus, and that has some issues. Uh, regarding how do you scrape other components? How do you provide other options of, of scrape configuration? Usually, right now, this is done by using the additional scrape config field and providing the configuration as is without any validation. What we wanted to do is instead of having service monitor, pod monitor, and probe built separately, we would like to have a CRD that is a base for all common fields in the scrape configuration. This way, every CRD that we will introduce later on, like service monitor again, or something else, would basically uh, use this, this common CRD that we wanted to name, I think, generic scrape config or something, and use this one and use com everything, com every common field in this CRD and just build on top of that, which would simplify creation of new CRDs and simplify adding common fields like authorization. I see. Yeah, next bit for a Thank you. I just don't really see how Prometheus agent comes into play with that because we can start doing the same with plain Prometheus. Um, I think his, um, his intuition was that um, the agent has supports a smaller set of fields that can be configured. Like there's no alerting, for example, there's no rule evaluation, I believe. So um, it would be an easier way to add something that's small and extend it over time. But still, those engines are separated. Those configuration fields are also separate. And Prometheus operator handles those also separately. 
So that's why I don't see how those two tie together. For at least for me, those are orthogonal things. Yeah. Uh, I think kind of the the idea what might be to use the opportunity of having a, like an alpha Prometheus agent theory and have then an alpha script config theory at the same level so that we can experiment uh, and later on graduate that API uh, to be stable, but uh, not going like with a script config theory that would be like at the same level, a V1 API. Also, oh, basically, Prometheus agent CRD would only use the new CRD for scrape configuration, and it wouldn't use service monitor or pod monitor. Yep, yep, like. yeah. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Both are alpha. That would be confusing as heck, but <laughs> it makes sense. Well, it's, I think I got something in half. Like The suggestion is to not use service monitors anymore. Oh, oh, at that's, least, a very, that's a very big change. Uh, or at least have a way to translate service monitors, pod monitors into scrape config resources. I think we, we cannot remove script, uh, uh, sorry, service monitors because that's basically invalidates everything that uh, we've done so far. It's just uh, to introduce an intermediary CRD that's so the, the API will, will stay the same. This is more about an internal implementation detail, I would say. Um, I mean, to one extent, it simplifies things internally, also allows uh, much more flexibility. But um, the idea is not to remove service monitors. It's just that to make that, to build them on top of another CRD that might be a bit more flexible. Yeah. So as far as I can see, we can go both ways and without design document that's debatable what we want to do because we can go with um, creating an intermediary CRD, like the scrape config CRD that would be uh, able to, to be a base for other CRDs like a service monitor, or we can go with the other way around and change all the um, existing ones that they would be converted into the scrape config CRD. I think the initial idea was that the scrape config would be a base for others and would be extended um, by other types, which means that they won't be removed at all. Yeah, I suppose ha having that as an alpha API allows us to kind of experiment and get things wrong. Whereas if you take the other approach, it kind of it makes it harder. You don't get to learn any of the lessons along the way. So. It's, it's a big bang uh, change, please, I think, if we go the other way. But maybe just to, um, to clarify on what you said, so is it possible to extend CRDs? Like the, the CRD concept is has this property. OK, I didn't know that. Yes, it, it is possible in the controller. And that controller gen has the ability to do that. I was experimenting with this in KP project. Ah, but OK, then this is something that controller gen uh, Implements is it is it native in Kubernetes or is it just a kind of a helper that controller gen implements? It's basically a types uh, extension of types in Go and controller gen just uses that. Mm, okay. So it's kind of transparent to to controller gen. There is no information about uh, underlying like intermediary CRD. There is only the, uh, the information about the output. Okay. So basically, from client perspective, from user perspective, um, they don't see that the CRD is based on some other CRD. Yeah, anyway, I think the like the first first step is going to be like some design document, because even the deployment model of the Prometheus agent is going to be different uh, from the regular Prometheus uh, stateful set. Uh, because you might want to run the agent as a daemon set, for instance, or you want probably 
to to shard it differently. Uh, so yeah, I guess there are lots of you need to rethink for me the the deployment model and just not say okay it's going to be the same as the regular Prometheus stuff, just that it's going to enable the agent mode because that's not probably the best uh, choice. Um, there is also, a, um, I think there is some compatibility when you create a Prometheus instance and then you run an agent after with the same data. Like the way the TSDB is, is written uh, is not compatible between agent and the server. So it's very, very, very uh, uh, dangerous to use the Prometheus CI. Yeah. that they actually shared the, the TSDB. Is there something? I am um, almost sure that there is some incompatibility. Like the way they write uh, to the TSDB folder is a little bit different. OK. But is that any problem if we disallow uh, storage for agent? If we use only ephemeral storage, then that should mean, shouldn't be a concern. Yeah, the firmware story should not be a concern. It's just uh, uh, trying to reinforce the idea to not use stateful sets. Yeah, I think uh, with agent, we need to investigate that again, what we want to use, because the daemon set is used by Grafana agent uh, commonly, and I think they are using deployment, well, just deployment object, but I'm not I sure. Think. I think they use them demo sets because Grafana agents also works with tracing and other observability signals. And tracing, they also uh, they usually run uh, with host network or host something. Uh, for us, I, I don't think it's really that important. I remember there were two deployment models. One was demo demo set for sure, and another one maybe was deployment, but I'm not. I didn't follow the project for a long time. Yeah, definitely. So you can run it, from what I recall, you can run it as a demand set, so on every node, or you can run it in deployment, in which case there is a sharding algorithm behind it. Like you can decide how you distribute the targets. Uh, and also something, uh, another project with with using a similar approach, which is using a similar approach, is the open telemetry collector operator. So yeah, just to say that we need to write down everything and uh, yeah, not just go ahead and implement a Prometheus agent CRD that would just mimic the existing Prometheus CRD that would not work definitely. Uh, so would would the agent also support service monitors and pod monitors and all of these things that we have so far? I think it makes sense. I think that's the main value of having the support here. Okay, a lot of discussions that we did not export to the document. Uh, well, let's try our best to, to not forget. <laughs> Any other, are we finished with this topic? Or anything else that we like to discuss? I had one topic. Um, so if we're finished with this one, do, does anyone ha else have anything to say about on this topic, or should we just move on? Okay, I'll take that as a move on. Um, so um, there was a something that happened in the CI, for example, during the last release. Um, there was a job that was regularly failing, so my um when i i was reviewing a pull request and i saw that it failed again and i thought oh, it's just a flaky job or it's about to fail 
and I merged the pull request. But then it turns out that this time, this one time, the job the job was failing with the um, it was correctly failing. So I'm um, to me having these uh, CI jobs that can fail and that don't block merging sometimes gets a bit fuzzy. Um, and for me, a CI should be binary. It's either failing and it's blocking merging or it's succeeding. Uh, I'm just curious if there is any convention or any expectations that I should have towards the CI um, that are different from, from you know, just the CI being binary and not having any ambiguity in it. Because uh, depending on the answer, I would also go, like to go and like change the CI to reflect what we agree on here. Yeah, so current way is that everything that is required is a hard stop for merging the PR. Everything, every job that can fail because it's not fully in our control is not marked as required. And those we need to investigate during the PR um, review. So if it is failing, um, we can go over, check if why it is failing. If that is failing because of some intermittent issue uh, not related to the PR, and then just comment that the, the CI is failing because uh, it's something not related to the PR, and follow with a merge. I've, at least that's what I was doing all the time. Um, yeah, that that sounds that sounds reasonable to me because I saw I don't know, last week we had like we were calling some scorecard service or some API that was just timing out, and it wasn't wasn't really that important. But you wouldn't really like to block all PRs based on that uh, third party service being down for some time. It seemed to be down flaky for a couple of days. Um, so yeah, I think like knowing what ones are required and what aren't and small investigation, which is kind of what we're doing, I think is probably sufficient. Okay, I think um, the, the one, yeah, that, that makes sense. It's just that I think in this particular case, um, the job had a, I think it was checking things that should not fail and check things that can fail. Um, in this I think specific case, it was checking for external external references in in um, I don't know, in some documentation. Um, so my kind of suggestion would be to have jobs that can fail, uh, have them as independent jobs, and then everything that must not fail should be its own job, so that um, there wouldn't be too much thinking whether, and there wouldn't be too much maybe investigation. So in this case, if we're checking external links and that can fail, we can have that as a dedicated job that can fail. But if we are checking for something um, that's still in the documentation but shouldn't fail, then that can remain in a job that must succeed in this case. I don't know if that makes sense. Can the, you're using MDocs, right? Can MDocs, uh separate that like run formatting or whatever and another only does external links yeah i think there's a there's a flag and uh, that we can toggle to disable uh, link checking oh. so do um but in, in in this particular case do we um i mean is link checking added there because it's just a copy paste from somewhere else or do we really want to check external links personally i don't really care about external links but i do care about our links to our documentation i i do think that the documentation that directs to broken links it's terrible ux yeah personally i do care <laughs> Then I'll, I'll look into that, see if we can maybe just run the checks on our internal links, um, if there's a way to, to toggle that in Mendox. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, look into that then, yeah.
But yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think with CAT and with the required checks, we still have the possibility to merge, right? There is just a warning that, okay, you, there is a check failing and, uh, but you can still merge. You mean with required or without required? With, with required. No, you cannot, unless you are the admin for the repository. Which, I mean, would be an option. Like, if we feel like it's exceptional enough that we don't, uh, we use it with care, then that might be another option, right? Yeah, so mainly, like, if you have a status of um, member in the, mm -hmm. in the organization and in the repository, uh, required checks checks are blocking you from merging anything. Mm -hmm. If a required check is failing, you cannot merge anything. If you are the administrator for that, um, your merge button will be red. You will have a notice uh, in mm -hmm. red, in bold, that the check is failing. But if you want to continue, you're on your own. There is every, like, everything mm -hmm. is in, in red, but you still can merge it. Yeah. Um, and as for the not required, this is a bit um, easier because if you are a member, you still can merge it and you will mm -hmm. still have a red button that's, or I don't remember if it's even, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's not, green. It's gray. You don't have the green button. I'm just checking right now on a PR that has uh, non required checks that are failing. So you can still merge but the button is gray. And like when everything is green for the CI, then you have a green button with all the checks. You don't see the, the status for all the checks, just that everything is green. But yeah, if we can like maybe revise what we consider to be required or not, if we can improve and have them more granularity. Yeah, okay. I can't indeed found another PR where I can't in fact yeah merge anything because the required check check is failing. Yeah. Yeah, we can refactor okay. that if anyone wants to take a point on that and check which which checks we want to actually <laughs> enable uh, that are required, I can change them. Um, yeah, also the UX is quite bad because then that matches on check names. So if when you change uh, the checks or you rename them, then the configuration is out of sync. And that's, yeah, that's the GitHub UI. Okay. Should we just discuss that now or open an issue? And leave that for later. I think we have time. We can go through through that. We have like eight checks, so that's not a lot. <laughs> yeah. Let me see the checks. It's, you are talking about uh, checks and permitters operator only, right? Uh, at least for now. Yeah, I think that was the the focus. But uh, yeah. Yep. Okay, so we have 15 checks. Some of those are duplicates uh, because we have, for example, Mac OS and Linux as uh, for generate and format and all that. So we do have every E2E as required. We have unit tests as required. We have a generation, but only on Ubuntu as required. And and extended yeah. tests plus a linter. Wow. There is end-to-end uh, -end test that they are not marked as required. Yes. Yeah. Mm. First one. So let's go with e 2 tests first. Do we want to have all of those as required? Because if so, um, yeah. I can yeah. do a simple, a simple way with uh, hack. Yeah, we have a simple hack uh, that we were introducing la uh, lately. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. 
Um, yeah, and, and that, uh, so yeah, I think you're talking about merge, having like a job that depends on these other jobs. Yeah, and if we can keep that one stable, then the, the name of that one stable, then we can add as many endpoint tests as we well. want. Exactly, that was the idea behind it. Okay, so E2E, those are required. What do we have? We have a build that is required. I think we should leave that as required. This is also a very fast test and separated into different workflow, which means that we can rerun that fairly easy. We have uh, Prometheus metrics check, which I don't know what this does. Okay, not sure either. It runs make check metrics. What does that do? It runs a script check metric. <laughs> it lint runs the linter, um, the prompt tool linter, I think. Oh, yes. Okay. It runs from linter lint. And what the, what does that do? In check uh, for uh, naming uh, conventions um, in the metrics exposed by Prometheus up layer. Oh, so it says static check. Okay, so it runs through the Go code. Yep. So yeah, we can leave it. Yeah, keep it. Then we have Golang linter um, as a required thing. Personally, I would love to see this gone from here and moved to something else like um, using Golang CI lint as a job. This way it would also post uh, comments or annotations, I think. So, and we wouldn't have that as a required thing. Yep. Yeah, take a note in the document. Yeah. But it should be a blocking job. It should still be a blocking job, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, I would love to see that not run as a GitHub action because we have limited number of uh, actions um, that can be run per organization, I think, or per repository. So if we can have less of those, this means that we can start more in parallel more meaningful ones. Isn't GitHub Actions free for public repositories? It is yeah, but free, but the limitation is that you have a number of limited uh, parallel runs ah, okay. in concurrency. But this is basically limited concurrency for jobs. Uh, is, so is, the, is each job run in a dedicated VM or is each workflow in a dedicated VM? Good question. I don't know. Okay. Uh, because uh, if it's per job, we can also consider just squashing a lot of the jobs and run like make and then uh, check metrics, lint, uh, yada, yada, yada. So the checks would be kind of run in, in a smaller amount of jobs. Yeah, it's pretty parallel, uh, just bringing hosting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was per job, but I'm not really sure. Workflow is just a convention for that. And I think that jobs are run, each one is per VM. So we can have few of those, like extended tests and unit tests, we can put that under one thing. And it would also like simplify uh, checking, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can merge some of them definitely. Yeah, so. One more is that generate and format. Um, 
and under that, I think we can put everything, <laughs> like every linter formatter that we have, we could just put into generate and format and be done with that. What do you think about it? Yep. I totally agree. If it, the end to end task takes uh, 30, 40 minutes, any job that doesn't take that long could be merged. Yeah, the, the, the end to end tests are the bottleneck anyway. Do we know if we have any like any way to speed those up? If adding yeah. more more resources would fix this or not? I, I tried this. Um, I think adding more CPUs might be helpful. Um, and there, but there's there are some tests that are actually quite long, especially the remote write, for example. Um, because there are like 20 test cases that it goes through. So each test case, if each test case takes one minute, for example, then that's 20 minutes already that you have to wait. Um, because you have to wait for Prometheus to scrape and the, the samples to be sent and stuff like that. And I think we have uh, two CPUs per VM. So uh, if we run things in parallel, by default, go test will just spin up to, will run two tests at a time. Um, so if we add more CPUs, we could run more tests in parallel. Um, I also tried to like bump the, to explicitly override the parallelism, but then we started to get flakes. So it's either the tests are not taking into account, um, they're not that, um, well isolated or just we need to, um, yeah, there's something going on maybe with the limited resources that we have. So the question is, where can we run a hosted GitHub Action Runner? Who wants to sponsor that? I think there is. There are some uh, companies that volunteer that. I think Equinix, Equinix, something like that. I almost spoke in Portuguese by accident. <laughs> and uh, we could go after. I'm not sure if uh, we will be able. To, to get some sponsors, but at least we could try. I, I spoke, I mean, I sent a request to GitHub itself. They said no. Uh, they recommended that we um, get the team, team subscription for the Prometheus Operator organization. Um, but we can reach out to other companies like DigitalOcean or um, Equinix, Equinix, or if if anyone has an idea, we can just spam twenty companies and uh, see if anyone gets back to us. Also, uh, going back on a very uh, old discussion, previously we discussed if we wanted to donate the product to CNCF, uh, and the conclusion is that we don't get any benefits anyway. So we decided to do not not do that. Like. I think they recently started uh, the projects can request clusters to CNCF and we can use those clusters to CI. But so that's one benefit that uh, didn't exist before. Maybe we could revisit that decision. And what's the what's the toil involved in being part of the CNCF? Yeah, a lot of stuff, I, I think. <laughs> that's a hard trade-off. Like they require training, they require a lot of stuff from the maintainers. We can first start with DigitalOcean and ask them. I know that, that they were or are using the operator internally, so we can ask them for credits. Yeah, I can see companies like sponsoring, like you said, like a cloud provider. Uh, giving us credits for free, uh, then how, the question for me is more how we can integrate that with GitHub Actions and don't end up like maintaining a complete uh, standalone CI infrastructure on those kind of compute resources, which I think like the, you are all aware that the advantage of GitHub Actions is that we don't have to maintain anything. 
Let's just keep up doing it for us. But yeah, worth, anyway, worth exploring the options. Uh, definitely. Uh, but also with GitHub, you can, I guess, attach additional runners. Uh, what did you mean we would have to maintain the virtual machines ourselves? Even if we don't have a dedicated CI, the, the VMs that run the jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's I'm not familiar enough with GitHub Actions and hosted runners. Maybe that's fairly simple and that would just work out of the box. Uh, and if if that's possible, then just that's fine by me, definitely. But that, I, I don't think we have the bandwidth to kind of maintain that. Uh, if that's more than a, an easy plug into the GitHub Action framework. As far as I remember, it was um, we would need to manage the VM and install GitHub Action Runner on that and connect it with a repository, which means that we will still be managing the VM itself. And that's a toy. That's a toil. I'm just checking the the CNCF repository about clusters, that they are donated by Equinix. And there is like $1 million budget, $1 million budget per year. And they also host the, if they manage, they maintain the, the clusters for us. That's, a, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, l let's focus on what we have right now and we can revisit so the CNCF yeah, okay, yeah. also later yeah. on. So exactly. right now, like uh, consolidating the checks together, we are still limited by that 40 minute check for remote ride. So maybe let's consider moving that to a separate job, just the remote ride thing. Um, so we will maybe get 20 minutes back or like even 10 minutes in this, this case is quite a lot of time, quite a lot of uh, time. Yeah, I can I can look at that again, so you can send that to me, um, and I can play with the end-to-end -end tests because I know that also, for example, alert manager that those tests uh, are capped at thirty minutes. So eventually, we'll get to that limit. So um, you know, we we can't really go too low, but thirty minutes is still better than forty-five or fifty. Yeah, especially considering that if we uh, unify some of other jobs and not have 15, um, the wait time to start the E2E uh, job will be uh, shorter. Because I think the concurrency limit is five or something like that. We have three minutes left. Uh, anything else this last minute? Well, I guess. Like no, yeah. I guess we're finished here. <laughs> we'll stop the recording and see you folks in two weeks.